Welcome to Windy Night Stories. Tonight's story is by Rebecca Harding Davis. A Strange Story from the Coast. The incident of which you have asked me to give you an account occurred six years ago, but the details are still fresh in my memory. The matter impressed me at the time with peculiar force. I am quite sure that I cannot convey any of this impression to you. I can only give you the facts, and very probably your shrewd common sense will readily find a rational explanation of them. I confess honestly, however, that I have never been able to account for them to myself on any ordinary basis of reasoning. In February of 1873, her physician ordered C to the seashore. Our medical men were then just beginning to find out the tonic of a bath of salt air for lungs and body, even in winter, was a sure restorer of exhausted vitality than the usual prescriptions of interminable quinine and beef tea. We went down together to an old farmhouse on the New Jersey coast in which we had spent a summer years before. The farmer, who was also, according to a common custom there, captain of a coast schooner, was trading in the south that winter and had taken his wife with him. We rented the house, opened it, built up fires and began housekeeping in a couple of hours. The older part of the house, built long before the Revolution, consisted of log huts joined one to another, through whose vacant rooms and fireless chimneys the wind from the sea whistled drearily. But the living room and chamber which we occupied, with their double doors, red rag carpets and hearths heaped with blazing logs from the wrecks that strewed the beach, were snug and comfortable enough. Outside, the solitude and silence, even at noonday, were so profound that it was incredible to us that we were but a day's journey from New York. This was surely some forgotten outskirt of the world which we had first discovered. The windows on one side of the living room opened on the vast sweep of water, swelling and sinking that day gray and sullen under the low wintry sky, and on the other, upon a plain of sand as interminable, broken at intervals by swamps overgrown with black bare laurel bushes, by pine woods and by a few lonely fishermen's houses, the surf boats set up on end against them, rows of crab cars and seine reels fronting the leafless orchards. When C and I had visited this coast before, it had borrowed a certain gaiety and lightness from the summer. The marshes were rich in color. Artists were camping under their yellow umbrellas here and there, catching brilliant effects of sky or water. Sportsmen from New York in irreproachable shooting rig were popping at the snipe among the reeds. The sea and bay were full of white scudding sails, but in winter it lapsed back to its primitive condition. The land seemed to answer the sea out of depths of immeasurable age and silence. The only sign of life was the trail of smoke upward to the clouds from some distant cabin, or a ghostly sail flitting along the far horizon. The sand heaped itself day by day in fantastic unbroken ridges along the beach. The very fences and houses had grown hoary with lichen and gray moss that shivered unwholesomely in the wind. Some of these old log houses had been built two centuries ago by Quaker refugees from England under the proprietary Barclay. They built the houses and settled down in them, so far barred out of the world on this lonely coast, that they did not know when their old persecutor Charles was dead. We were almost persuaded that they had forgotten to die themselves when we saw the old gray-coated, slow-moving folk going in and out of these houses, with the same names as those of the men who had built them, the same features and inexorable habits of hard work and prosy gossip, the same formal tricks of speech and strange superstitions. Indeed, these people usually live to an old age so extreme that it seems as if death himself forgot this out-of-the-way corner of the world on his rounds. In many of the houses there had been but two generations since the days of the Stuarts, son and father living far beyond the ninetieth year. A wiry, withered youth of seventy-six, Captain Jeremy Holcomb, who was still living, by the way, whom we met one day on the beach, constituted himself our guide and protector. He took us from farmhouse to farmhouse by day to make friends with the old people, always coming in at night to tell us the histories of them in their houses, and to chuckle boyishly over the unaccountable notions of them as was getting on in years, and to sip a glass of toddy, unctuously smacking his withered lips and wagging his white pole. One day, as a storm was rising, C and I led the old man across the garden at an earlier hour than usual to set him up safely on his way homeward. A raw nor'easter blew heavily off the sea that evening. The sun had not been seen for two days, 
The fog was banked up to the landward in solid, wet masses. The landscape was walled in by it until nothing was left in view but our house and the rotted leaves of the garden beds, half buried now in drifted sand. You have never told us the history of this house, Captain, said C., looking back at the dilapidated log building behind us. Holcomb, as I thought, evaded the question at first. The house, he said when C. urged it, had been built by a family named Wine, and still belonged to them, the young man for whom we rented it being himself only a tenant. The wines were of the oldest Quaker stock. The men had always followed the water. They took to brandy, Holcomb said, as a lamb to its dam's milk. Men and women was uneasy, wandering folk. But they all came home to this house at the last, which was the reason, he supposed, they were so long-lived. He referred here to a belief which we had found current among these people, that a man's hold upon life was stronger in the house in which he was born than in any other. Because there, explained the captain, is where the earth first got a grip on him, and there's the last place it'll be loosened. Now, the wines all lived in this house to an uncommon old age. There was a kind of backbone of obstinacy in them all. I reckon death himself had to have a tough fight with them before he got them under. Old Abner Wine lived to be a hundred and four. He died, let me see, he died just sixty years ago, come January. Priscilla was his youngest daughter. She's living yet. She's got no notion of dying. She's the only wine, though, that is living. On further inquiry, it appeared that this said Priscilla had married a Perot, and, being now a childless widow, occupied the Perot house, another decayed old habitation on the other side of the marshes to the north. She was ninety-two last June, said Holcomb. It's thirty years since she has been able to hear thunder, but she keeps a watching and a watching out of them black eyes of hers. God knows what for. But whenever I see her, I says to myself, It'll come to you some day, Priscilla, says I, whatever it be. She's got an awful hold on living, that there woman. All the wines has, as I told you. She's a mere shackle of bones, and as deaf as a dud shark yonder. But she's got a kind of life in her yet, such as these pink and white mishy young girls never knowed. I'll take you to see her tomorrow. If she gets a sight of anybody that's come from out of the towns in the crowd, it kind of gives her a fresh start. Yes, we'll go and see her tomorrow, climbing over the bars. Well, I'll be going now. That's all there is to tell about this house. No, no, said C. One moment, Captain. Those queer squares of brick at the end of the garden, what are they? The old man shuffled uneasily. I don't see no brick. I don't know nothing about em. Surely you can see them, close to the house, almost covered with the sand. They look like the entrance to a vault, or they might be graves. By this time, Holcomb had succeeded in ridding his startled face of every glimmer of meaning. Oh, them? Staring at them with unconcern. They were there long before I was born. I wouldn't worry myself about them if I was you. They've something to do, slightly, with the old wines that's dead and gone. I'd let them rest. Never dig deep into a rotten marsh, as we say here roundabouts. With that, old Jeremiah hobbled quickly away, and C and I returned to the house, pausing to look curiously at the sunken squares of brick over which the sand had drifted deep. I remember that C remarked irritably that it was evident that the old man knew for what purpose they had been built there, and chose to conceal it from us. There is something evil about them, she added, declaring that whenever she passed them, she was conscious of some unpleasant physical influence, as though she had breathed miasma. Her illness had made her peculiarly susceptible to outside influences, real or imaginary. I thought nothing more at the time, therefore, of her assertion, though later circumstances reminded me of it. The next day we crossed the marshes under Jeremiah's guidance and found Priscilla in the old Perot house. This woman differed from any other human being I have ever seen in some indescribable way. The peculiar effect of it upon me returns whenever I remember her. I would rather see a ghost than to think of that nightmare of a woman. Age had ravaged and gnawed her away mercilessly. Nothing was left of her in the world but a little quick-moving shadow. The delicate features, the restless, bird-like hands, the shrunken outline of shape, made but a silhouette of the actual woman she had once been. The brown flannel gown and crossed white handkerchief which she wore after the Quaker fashion seemed to me like a load hung upon a ghost. For the rest, she was vivacious, keen, hard. She talked incessantly in a shrill, vehement pipe. Her answers necessarily were written or by signs. 
She welcomed us with a kind of fierce eagerness, examined the cut and material of our clothes, and questioned us about the city and the news of the day with the delight of a prisoner to whose dungeon had come a glimmer of light from the world outside. She chattered in return the gossip of the neighborhood, gossip which from her lips obscurely hinted at malignant and foul meanings, occasionally rebuffing old Holcomb with savage contempt. But she's not such a bad one, he said, turning deprecatingly to us. Naturally, she's a kind, decent soul, Priscilla is, but you see... It's excitement to her to talk that way. All them wines must have excitement of one sort or another. The men took to liquor, and the women... Now, Priscilla, suddenly checking himself, it's like being shut up in jail, what with living here alone in that dreadful deafness. The old creature had gone, moving with a quick, nervous step, to a corner cupboard, from which she brought out a plate of seed cakes. She stood holding them out to me, poising herself on tiptoe, her dark, luminous eyes fixed on me from underneath the shaggy white brows. No, see, I said, this is not a bad woman. She is not immodest or malignant. Yet I drew back from her. Now I was conscious wherein she differed from other aged people. It was a young woman who looked out of those strange eyes at me. Old Priscilla Perot, in the isolation of her thirty years of deafness, had grown vulgar and bitter in her speech. But back of that was another creature, who was not vulgar, who never spoke. I fancied that it looked out with all the unsatisfied passion and longing of youth through those eyes before me. They seemed perpetually challenging the world to give back something which was lost with a silent, sad entreaty strangely at variance with the shrill, mean talk that came from the woman's lips. I wondered idly when this creature in her had ever lived, and what had killed it, and whether it would ever, in all the ages to come, waken and live again. How many possible human beings, after all, die in each of us and are forgotten before the body gives up too and has to be hidden out of sight. Old Priscilla went out into the kitchen and bustled aimlessly about. Our coming had made her restless. She laughed without cause. Frequent nervous shudders passed over her lean body. It's always that way when anyone from the city comes near her, said Jeremiah. She was main fond of the crowd and of town. So I should have guessed, said C. Do you notice the dainty dress and the high shoes? and the jaunty bit of ribbon in her cap, yet she impresses me strangely, as though she might have once had a much finer, more delicate nature than she shows us. She has not always lived here? What is her history? Turning to Holcomb. The old fellow gave a scared look at the wan little figure skipping in and out of the dark kitchen. Lord, how should I know? She belongs to them as was dead and gone before my time. To stop short all further inquiry, he began talking to her by signs. She perched herself upon the high wooden chair at one side of the fireplace, looking at C, her head a little on one side. She wants to know what changes I remember in this place. For so Holcomb had interpreted C's question. Not many, not many. My time has been so short. Now, my father could remember when a good part of Ocean and Monmouth counties were under the sea. But he lived to a good age. Under this house where you are, there's been dug up shark's teeth and the backbones of whales. My grandfather, it's likely, could remember when they swam over this field. Pursing up her thin lips thoughtfully, thee wasn't here in the War of 1812, turning sharply on sea? No. I was here. I had come home for the first time from New York then. I watched the English vessels come up the inlet. It was a gusty afternoon like this. They had come up to plunder the farms. The men that weren't friends took their guns and went down to fire on them from the shore. And those that were friends, asked C, took their guns and went along, with a shrill laugh and nod. Oh, the young people in the house were terribly frightened. It was all I could do to keep their courage up, silly children. Were you not afraid? No, I wasn't young, and I had nothing to lose. She turned her head with her back to us, and was talking into the darkness. She hurled out the last words with a kind of defiance. I had nothing to lose. True enough, said Jeremiah, with many wags of the head and senile blinks of sympathy, but, catching our inquiring looks, he recovered himself with a certain deprecatory cough and leaned his chin on his cane, silent and attentive. I set the children to barring up the windows, continued Priscilla after a moment's pause, and then I took a ladder and climbed onto the roof. I put my back against the chimney and my feet on the top rung, and there I saw the fight. Our men hid among the salt grass of the marsh and picked them off one by one. 
They was main good shots. I saw Ben Stover aim at a man on the foremast, and then there was a whiff of smoke and down he went in a lump into the water. They said his dying yell was terrible to hear, she added with a chuckle. What became of Stover after that? asked Jeremiah. He died when he was a young man, only sixty or thereabout. He used to go up and down the beach looking for kids' treasure, muttering to himself. They said he went mad because there was blood on his hands, him being a Quaker. But I knew different from that. It was the money that drove him mad. Kids' money. He was so sure of finding it. She fell back in her chair, breathless with her vehemence. But in a few minutes she sat upright again and thrust her bloodless, peaked face into mine. Where did they say they came from? New York, mother, signed Jeremiah. New York. Ah, drawing in her breath. I live nigh in New York, in a country place three mile from town. But now they tell me it's in the heart of the city, built over with huckster shops. Does thee know it? I shook my head. No, nobody would remember it, she said gently. I would know it. Nothing they could build on it would hide it from me. Her eyes deepened in their sad quiet. The shrill tones softened. For a moment it was the voice of a young woman that we heard. C was about to question her, but Jeremiah interposed. Take care. Don't ask her what she means. Never before since I've known her has she spoken of the time she was in New York. God knows what's drove them words out of her now. To change the current of her thoughts, he leaned forward and told her by signs the story of our coming to the wine house. I was quite willing that she should be turned away from any dangerous subjects. I had the uncomfortable feeling when with her that we were dealing with death himself, or with some forgotten part of a past age more alien and incomprehensible than death. Thee is living in my house, turning sharply on us? Yes, it's mine. It will never belong to any but a wine. I know every board in it. Her head dropped on her breast, and her eyes were fixed on vacancy. After waiting a few moments, finding that she had apparently forgotten us, we rose to leave her. As C came up to bid her goodbye, she said, Will you come to your house while we are there? I? She started up, standing erect without her staff. Her voice was feebler than a whisper. Her hands were clasped over her head. But it was the voice and gesture of a young, passionate woman. Into that house? I'll never cross that threshold while I'm living. It's just a step across the marsh, thee knows, appealing to Jeremiah, but it's nigh sixty years since I put my foot in it. I've never forgot that I was Josiah Perot's wife. There's them waiting on me there as Josiah never could abide. But when I'm dead, she threw out her arms in a sudden indescribable gesture of freedom, I'll have done with Josiah Perot when I'm dead. C drew me away, and we hurried homeward. Glancing back, we could see the woman standing in the doorway. Her back was turned to us, looking out at the sea. It was a gusty, chilly afternoon. Spectral whitest drifts of fog were blown inland across the marshes. The sun went down in an angry yellow glare which foreboded ill. And then night fell suddenly, unusually dark, full of shrill whispers of the wind through the swamps and the threatening roar of the sea. We had, however, I remember, a comfortable hot supper soon ready, and we closed the curtains and heaped up the fire in the living room to shut out the darkness and strange noises without. When supper was over and Captain Holcomb was seated with his pipe in the chimney corner, we urged him to tell us the story of Priscilla without reserve. There's not much to tell, he said. She was born in this house, and she married Josiah Perot well on in life, and if Josiah was a bit stupid, he was a steady, God-fearing fellow, and that's more than can be said of any wine that ever lived. But before she married Perot? Well, nothing happened remarkable, unless, he added reluctantly, that curious occurrence at Amner Wine's death. I can tell you about that, dropping into the sing-song of an oft-told tale. Abner Wine was this woman's father. He lived to be a hundred and four. He lived with his wife down to the Shark River, for the old people had give up this house to their daughter Peggy, who married Sam Volk. Where was Priscilla? Well, I might as well tell the whole thing. It was like this. She wasn't like the rest of them. She wasn't as handsome as Peggy, but she was of a different sort, I've heard say, finer and harder to please. She went up to York, and there she fell in with a Captain John Salter, commanding a brig that run to the Mediterranean. He was a handsome fellow, according to accounts, and of a high family. 
very different from the wines. Word came back that she was married to him, and next, that always was the queer part of it to me, that he had sent her to school. Oh, I've heard my father say when she came back in 1812, she could speak one of them foreign tongues quite fluent. Her father always set great store by Priscilla, though she never came in nigh him. Peggy grew to be a humble, hard-working woman in the middle age, and was a faithful daughter. But, Lord, he cared not a copper cent for her. It was all my daughter Priscilla, because she had made the grand marriage in New York. When her father died down to Shark River, Peggy went there. She said, Now, Daddy, thee must come along home to me. I will not, Margaret, he says. But thee must, says she. Thee cannot live here alone, for he was then ninety-eight. I have my lines to watch, says he, for he was a fisherman, thee knows. Very well, Daddy, says Peggy. Thee can set these lines in the inlet just as well as the Shark River. Then she ups and packs his clock and his wooden chair. It's the one I'm sitting on, only it had a sheepskin cover on then, and his tea kettle and his fire dogs, so as he might feel at home, and she fixed them all up in this here room in back of me. Jeremiah, with his staff, pushed open the door to the half-ruined chamber behind him. The log walls had fallen to decay half a century ago, but there was a fireplace with rusted irons on the hearth, the very fire dogs he had mentioned, perhaps. This was his room, and he could do as he pleased in it. He used to sit by the door yonder, his old deaf yellow dog Turk lying atween his knees, both of them a-looking out at the sea hour in and hour out. He lived on here with Peggy for six years. In that time no word came from Priscilla. He used to talk about her and her grandeur to the men a-fishing, but we all knowed it was just his notions, for she never sent him a letter or made a sign. I was a pert young lad then, rising sixteen. It's just sixty years ago, last October, when one morning Peggy went in to get the old man's coffee for him. She always made his bite of breakfast ready before anything else. I'll have no coffee, Peggy, says he. Is thee sick, Daddy, says she, for it was the first time he had ever refused his breakfast. As for sickness, he had never been sick an hour since any living man could remember, though as to his boyhood nobody was left on this earth that remembered that. So Peggy was sort of stunned. Is thee sick, says she? No, I was never better, he says, but I'll eat not, I tell thee. So he fell asleep, and Peggy went out. But she could not tend to her work, she was that dazed. She told me she was mending Sam's net that morning, Sam was her husband, and presently out comes Daddy dressed and leaning on his staff as usual. He sat down in this chair by the fire yonder, and she brought him his breakfast, and he ate it. About an hour after, Joshua Van Dorn came in, and he and Peggy talked to the blue mackerel, for there was a school of them in, and Sam had made a good haul that morning. Joshua was but a boy of twenty, but a strong, rugged fellow. Abner said nothing to him until he was on his feet to go. Then he says, Joshua, Sam will be out eel fishing tonight, and I want thee to come and watch with me. I'll die tonight when the tide goes out. Joshua thought it was just his notions. All right, Daddy, says he, winking at Peggy. I'll come and watch with thee and eat breakfast with thee too in the morning. Who will I bring with me? Jeremiah Holcomb? Jeremiah will do as well as another. It's the same to me. It'll not take a strong man to streak me, says the old man, and he laughed, looking down at himself, for he was lean like Priscilla. The wines wear away with age. Peggy said he sat most all day by the door yonder, looking out to sea. There's some think that old seafaring men see a warning from the water when their times come. I don't know how that may be, but old Abner, he sat looking out all day. When Sam came in, he talked about the blue mackerel hall. Sam watched him careful, but he couldn't see as there was aught the matter with him. Was no clergyman sent for, demanded C. Did nobody remind him of the God that he was going to meet? Jeremiah looked up startled, chuckled, and grew suddenly grave. Nobody would go to a wine with that sort of talk. I doubt if old Abner, in all his hundred years, had ever thought of a God, any more than his dog Turk had. Him and Priscilla was just alike. They belonged to this earth. But as to their turning up again in any other, I don't know, I reckon they won't, shaking his head decisively. Go on with the story, said C. Well, come evening, Sam started out eel fishing. Daddy nodded to him. Goodbye, Sam Volk, says he. I'll be gone afore thee gets back. Sam humored him. Goodbye, Daddy, he says. 
Is there aught I can do for thee before I go? No, he says, no. But he took Sam's hand and kept looking up at him. Unless, he says, thee could fetch Priscilla here. I'd like to have seen the girl before I go. I have it on my mind that there's something she wants to say to me. I can't do that, thee knows, Daddy, says Sam. For we all thought she was in foreign parts. But she'd been living in New York for four years. And that very night, as it turned out, she was on her way home in John Van Dorn's schooner. Well, Joshua and I came in to watch. We sent Peggy to bed at the usual time, eight o'clock, for neither she nor we thought aught really ailed the old man. He took no notice of her when she went, nor of the children. He never could abide children. I'll make you some toddy, boys, to keep you awake, he says, and we were willing. There was not a man on the Jersey coast who could brew toddy like old Abner. It was prime toddy, that's a fact. He drank a bit, and then he went to bed. He wouldn't have any help in undressing. And when he was stretched out, he whistled for old Turk, and the brute lay down across his feet. Good fellow, good fellow, he says, and he put his hand on the dog's head and straightened himself, and so went to sleep. About ten o'clock Joshua called to me. He was standing by the bed. Jerry, says he, there's a queer settling in the old man's face, and his pulse is mighty low. Shouldn't wonder if he'd been in the right of it about himself after all. Shall I call Peggy, I says? No, says he, wait a bit. But in an hour, he says, Jerry, go and call Peggy. So I called her. But what could we do? He was going out with the tide. He didn't move or speak, and his eyes were shut. He didn't hear Peggy or the children when they was crying about him. His breath got slowly thinner and thinner, and his flesh colder. When Peggy called to him, he took no notice. But the dog raised himself after a while on his forelegs, and looked in his face and gave a howl. I declare it scared me, it was so like a human being. The old man stirred at that, and sort of smiled, and his lips moved as if to say, Good fellow, but he was too far gone to speak. Then it was all quiet. I opened the window yonder, pointing to a square opening in the ruined wall of the room outside, and I stood by it watching the tide go down, just as you might be doing now. And he lay on the bed here just by the door. It was a clear night, and I could see the line of white surf sinking lower and lower. I knowed by Peggy's face, leaning over him, that he was going with it fast. At last the sea fell out of sight into the darkness. Then I shut the window. I knowed it was all over. When I come up to the bed, he was dead. Joshua was closing his eyes. We folded his hands and straightened him. It seemed to me but a few minutes till he was stark and stiff and dreadful cold. I remember Joshua said it was unusual, and was because there was so little blood in his body, but how that might be, I don't know. We sat with him till morning. Now, here's the curious part of the story. You'll likely not believe it, but I'll tell you word for word just as it happened. An hour after Abner Wine died, his daughter Priscilla came to the house. She had landed at the inlet, where the men were a-fishing, and Sam brought her over. She was not a very young woman, but she was like a lady, very fine-appearing. She was greatly excited when she found her father dead, though she scarcely spoke a word. You come too late, says Peggy. You might have given him a good deal of comfort, but you're too late. I didn't know before that Peggy was so bitter against her. I must speak to him, she said, and she tore off the sheet and put her hand to his heart. I could see her start when she felt the cold. Daddy, she cried, Daddy. Let the dead rest, Priscilla, says Peggy. Go out, all of you, she says motioning to the door. Let me have him to myself. I went out and took Peggy. Priscilla kept a crying in a low voice. Daddy, Daddy. I went outside. I was that curious and looked in the window. For God, I tell you the truth. The dead man opened his eyes and sat up. Why did you bring me back, he said. Why did you not let me alone, Priscilla? I was at rest. She leaned over him, sobbing. Presently, he says, is your husband here? Then she whispered something. God knows what, but I reckon the whole truth was wrenched out of her. You can't lie to the dead. He sat up in the bed, and I saw him point with one hand to the door. Be gone, says he. You are no daughter of mine. She stood a minute, and then came out, and ran a past me, crying, into the dark. Of course you only fancied that you saw the man alive through the window, said C., I don't know, said Holcomb doggedly. 
I do know is she has never crossed the doorway from that night, and that's sixty years gone. And, lowering his voice, when we come back into the room, the old man was dead and stark as we had left him, but he was sitting bolt upright in the bed. What do you suppose she had told him? Oh, that soon come out. She had never been John Saltaire's wife. A sort of shame had seized her at last, and she had left him and come home. She's lived here ever since. Four years later, she married Josiah Perrault, who was a heap better husband than she deserved. She married him for a home. She could never abide to work. But nobody ever thought she cared aught for him. The wines never forget, and I believe she thinks of John Saltaire at this minute, and cares for him just the same as she did when she was a young girl. What became of him? Did he ever find her? I asked. Jeremiah hesitated. I didn't mean to tell thee that. A year after her father died, Saltaire found out where she was, and put off straight from New York on a schooner for this inlet. The schooner, the petrel it was, struck the bar out yonder, and the crew was lost, Saltaire and all. They buried him in the sand on the beach, just where they came ashore, as the custom was. The old man rose and began to put on his coat. We were not sorry to have him go. His ghastly story had made us quite willing to close the door on the dilapidated apartment outside and to turn our thoughts to cheerfuler matters. For a week afterward, the threatened nor'easter storm kept us indoors. The captain did not come to pay his daily visit, and we heard from a neighbor that he was attending on Priscilla Perot, who was awaiting her call. Jerry's a main good doctor, she added, but I doubt he'll not keep old Priscilla. She's being took off before her time. The wines lived to a great old age, but they say she's been restless like ever since she talked to thee about her young days in this house. The storm continued to rage so heavily that it shut us in to an absolute solitude. Even the hardiest fishermen did not venture out upon the beach. On the second night it abated. C and I were sitting by the fire reading between ten and eleven o'clock when, finding that the beating of the rain upon the roof had ceased, I opened the door into the ruined room of which Holcomb had told the story and looked out. The wind had changed. The storm clouds were driving to the east and were banked on that horizon in a solid rampart. The moon shone out whitely on the surging sea, on the drenched marshes webbed with the swollen black lines of the creeks. The tide water had risen to an unprecedented height, and was within three feet of our door. I called C to look. If the storm had lasted a few hours longer, I said, the wine house would have gone at last. We both stood in the doorway between the living room, in which we had been sitting, and Abner Wine's old chamber. The latter was clearly lighted by the moon and by the fire and the lamplight in the room behind us. As I looked down through the broken wall to the marsh, C touched my arm, whispering, Who is it? I turned. A small, dark figure was crossing the beach, coming up toward the house. It came with such rapidity that before I had time to speak, it stood in the outer doorway and was in the room beside us. Priscilla, cried C., the woman had reached the spot where, as Jeremiah told us, her father had died. She halted there a moment. I saw her face as distinctly of that of C, being about the same distance from both. It was Priscilla, and yet not Priscilla. The weight of age had dropped away. This was the creature which I had fancied still lived in the woman. Young, passionate, it might be wicked, but in no sense Perot's vulgar, malignant widow. She hesitated but a moment, and then passed through the back door into the garden, where the sand lay heaped by the storm in deep, wet drifts. C and I hurried after her, each with the same thought, that the dying woman had become deranged and had escaped from her attendants with the wild fancy of reaching her old home. She suddenly flung out her arms with a vehement gesture of triumph, and passed around a projection of the wall. We reached the spot in an instant. It was the place where the mysterious heaps of brick were erected, one of which rose slightly above the sand. She was not there. Sea and marsh and beach were utterly vacant. We went into the house, and, I am bound to confess, we slept little that night. Captain Holcomb came early the next morning. The widow Perrault is dead at last, was his first greeting. What time did she die? asked C. 
last night at half past ten o'clock. C rose, and going out, beckoned the old man to follow her. These are graves, she said, pointing to the heaps of bricks. Who were buried here? I didn't care to tell thee. I was afraid it might make thee uncomfortable. But, as thee knows so much, the crew of the petrel was buried under them. That one which is part uncovered by the wind is where Captain John Saltaire is laid. The old man never knew our reason for asking. There is my ghost story, the only one for which I have never heard a rational explanation. The End